Hey guys, Pete here. History is a form of memory, but what does it mean to remember? We think naturally of our own past, our lives day by day, and through them we see the events of our time. We are black and white, rich and poor, foreign born and domestic. And yet if our pasts are separate, then aren't our histories separate too? Ask yourself, who writes the books? Who chooses what we remember and what gets forgotten? So we have made it to the finale of season four of Fargo. It's a definitive ending to this chapter of the story. I'm going to recap what happened, break it down, and at the end I'll tell you how I felt about it. Before we get started, all of what I just said should be setting off your natural spoiler warnings. If not, just to be clear, this video will include spoilers for the finale of Season 4. If you haven't watched it yet, then this video won't be for you. And so now let's get into it. The episode opens with a montage. We see all the characters we've lost throughout the season. While they all didn't necessarily strike a chord, seeing Rabbi and Dr. Senator certainly did, and the Johnny Cash playing in the background over the great looking photography made for a fine way to open things up. From there we find Loy and Abel talking on a park bench. The same park bench where Loy and Donatello fought and met early in the season. We check in with Josto, who's drinking heavily, and you can't blame him. His brother just died, his mom fairly recently, and of course the season started with the death of his father. And we also see that his lover, Orietta Mayflower, is in fact in jail. Over at the Smutney's place, we see Loy's oldest son Lemuel handing over the keys to the family. They're moving their things out, they're handing the business back over to the family, and so we learn that Ethel Rita's appeal to Loy was successful, and that he is in fact a man of his word. His son says impressive on the way out, and Ethel Rita's mother Debrell says yes she is. In their meeting, Loy returns Donatello's ring to Abel. Orietta is pleasantly surprised that someone's paid her bail even though she doesn't know who it is. We see her boss, Dr. Harvard, talking at the hospital, talking about how they had a murderer right there under their roof. Unfortunately for him, he's attacked by Josto outside. He's thrown into the back of his car with Josto's would-be father-in-law, Milvin, the alderman. He takes them out in the middle of nowhere, he shoots them up inside the car, and then in a dramatic sequence, he flicks his cigarette, burning the car with their bodies in it. That cuts to the ending of Loy and Abel's meeting. The cannon leader asks him if he wants the war to be over, and tells him to get his house in order. Abel seems to be on board, he tells him I'll get back to you, and then he leaves, and in the car we see that the youngest Fada brother, Zero, has been returned to the family. Zero leaves him with a smile, they share this smile, and again this sort of underlines that Loy isn't completely dishonorable. In a heavy duty scene with a lot of slow motion, we watch Loy stand at the window of his hotel staring out, thinking about the situation. We see Leon sneak in, he has a gun with a silencer, he's about to take him out, but before he can pull the trigger, Opal creeps up and strangles him to death. I really enjoyed how Loy never breaks his stare out the window. The whole thing happens and he's still in the same position he was in the beginning of the scene. Across town at Spuds all the time, where Dr. Senator was killed outside, we watch Happy and his henchmen get taken out. It's a classic mobland execution that looks pretty great. With Loy's threats neutralized, we go back to find Josto. Joe Bulow tells him that they got cannon, it's over, we won. This is exactly what he wanted to hear, so he's ready to go out and celebrate, but quickly figures out something's wrong when he sees that Abel sitting on a chair with the rest of the gang behind him, and Orietta's at his side. His concierge tells him that he's accused of crimes against the family. He accuses him with getting Orietta to kill his father so that he could wear the crown, and even implies that he took out Gaetano. Josto tries to deny it, and for what it's worth, he didn't realize that Orietta was a serial killer, so he wasn't actually telling her to kill his father, but that's how she interpreted it, she followed through with it, and she's happy to tell the rest of the gangsters in the room that that's exactly what happened. It turns out that she may be a serial killer who likes to kill people, but she feels it's very important to be truthful in certain situations. Josto tries to cast doubt, then he threatens Abel saying he's going to get in touch with New York. That's when he finds out his fate is sealed, when Abel tells him that New York has already approved the hit. One more thing that we get from this exchange is that Abel believes that the Fada family has had problems because they've been run too long as a family business. He says, we live in the new world now, we need a new way. 
And of course, this plants the seeds for what we see with the KC mob in season two. Josto and Orietta are taken to a freshly dug hole in the ground with their name on it. Josto tries to find an angle to get his way out of the situation, but other than making Joe Bulo laugh with the question, hasn't there already been enough killing? His pleas go unanswered. To add insult to injury, when asked if they have any final requests, Orietta asks that they kill Josto first so she can watch. I thought this was a pretty good touch. He gets shot almost immediately after, and she looks really turned on by the whole situation. We then see her looking at her own reflection in the car, and I like to think that she's watching so she can see her own death as well. Either way, she gets her bullet, and they're both left behind. With things settling down, the Cannon family leaves the hotel and returns home. When he gets there, the doors open, and I thought this played pretty well too, because we know Zelmer's out there somewhere. So when he puts together the pieces that his son has returned, his son that he thought was dead, it made for a pretty good reunion. And it was also nice to see that Rabbit made it as well, he was right there on the bed. At this point, it seems like Loy's won. All that's left to do is for him to go talk to Abel and get back to business as usual. Unfortunately, things don't go over as planned. Abel tells him there's a few small adjustments he had to write down. It turns out that it's not a few at all. It actually amounts to Lloyd losing half of his business. He's justifiably angry, but there's really nothing he can do about it. Abel justifies it, saying it's part of their new national plan. He says, you too are a national outfit, yes? Wait, no, you're one man in one city. What do they say, big fish, small pond? but we're the C. The Italian knows that he wants to kill him, but reinforces the fact that he has no chance of taking back over the city. He leaves him with the idea of, we're not taking half, we're leaving half. And Loy knows that if he doesn't accept the deal, they'll kill him and find somebody else who will. He goes back to his house, he tells Opal to go home, he looks in the window, he sees his happy family, and it's like he has this moment of acceptance. He lost this struggle for power, the deck was stacked against him, but seeing his family happy and knowing that they all made it out seems to give him some peace. And it turns out to be well-timed since Selmer does show up, stabbing him several times and killing him. It seemed pretty inevitable that she'd show up, so it wasn't a big shock. But she does tell him as he's dying that it was for Swanee, so at the very least, she got justice for her dead partner. Satchel caught a glimpse of her in the window, so he went outside. She drops the weapon and leaves, and he sees his father's last moments. Loy isn't able to say anything to him, so they just share the moment, and it does carry some additional weight knowing that Satchel had just lost Rabbi not that long ago. And it was a nice touch that he's pulled away from reading Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, which he first heard about in the Barton Arms. The episode comes to a close with Ethel Rita reading her history report. It ends with what I opened with. Who chooses what we remember and what gets forgotten? We see her with her family and then we see her sitting in a chair with some suitcases and we see her get up to leave. In a post-finale interview, Noah Hawley says that it represents her leaving. Her reward for surviving the story is that she goes off and has an unremarkably positive life. That was the worst thing she ever went through in her life. And her reward is that, like James Baldwin, she's going to move to Paris, she's going to become a writer, and she's going to prosper outside of America. She knows in that moment that she can't prosper inside America, and she has the wherewithal to get out. The episode proper ends there, but we also get a mid credit scene where it's confirmed that Satchel does grow up to be Mike Milligan. We see Mike in the back seat with Gail Kitchen driving. It's a scene right out of season two where they're going down the road. The way it's cut, we see that this is the same road that Satchel walked home on. And we see Mike reloading the gun like Rabbi did and know now that he has an origin story. And in that, season four of Fargo comes to an end. I think this finale is much like the rest of the season. It had its moments. It was a surprisingly short episode, and that makes me question how much the pandemic affected this season overall. The way that the middle of the season was so strangely cut together, and then you have this finale that feels pretty short, it seems like on some level they weren't able to execute their idea completely. The music was great. The cinematography was great. Some of these scenes really are dazzling. But it's funny because last week when I did my recap, I said I might follow up with another theories video. And what I found in doing that was that, one, I watched the trailer and it pretty much laid the whole thing out. 
Two, I went online looking and pretty much everyone was saying the same thing that I had thought. And three, it almost came out exactly that way. It really didn't turn out to be shocking or exciting. It had some tension and there were times where I wasn't sure where they were going based on things that they had set up earlier, but it just felt sort of adequate at the end, like an adequate conclusion for a season that had some real problems getting to the finish line. There's not much else I can say about it. It was enjoyable all the way through. I really enjoyed some of the characters, Orietta, Rabbi, Ethel Rita. Deffy was fun. Dr. Senator had a real presence, but it's not an example of Fargo firing on all cylinders. It sort of wasn't able to find its balance. For me, it felt like a weird situation where it was too much and not enough at the same time. Too many characters, too many stories, not enough oomph when they all came together. And it's kind of disappointing because the ideas behind it and some of the themes really are interesting. And it's a real shame if the pandemic sort of threw things off the tracks. And with that, I'm going to leave it there. Let me know in the comments what you think about this finale, what you think about this season. What is your ranking for the four seasons of Fargo at this point? Are you still hoping to see a season five? And in what time period would you like to see them land in in that? Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks for following along with the season with me, and thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.